Aló. Para saber cómo Hola, le va. Pablo Escobar. ¿Qué ha hecho? Le quiero pedir un favor muy grande en nombre del país. Sí. ¿Por qué no hacemos algo para que se entregue y le garantice la vida y se pueda ver con su familia? Yo estoy disponible para eso, yo soy el, el, el que tiene mejor voluntad en este caso. Estoy dispuesto a aceptar una casa de intermedia, pero necesito hacer un estudio de esas casas porque es que yo no puedo permanecer en una casa urbana porque me colocan un carro bomba y... y... In this video, we are diving deep into the dark truths surrounding one of history's most notorious figures, Pablo Escobar. While much has been said about his rise to power and the wealth he amassed, what often gets lost in the shadows are what is truly shocking about him. Pablo Emilio Escobar Gaviria was born on December 1, 1949, in the small town of Rio Negro, Colombia, nestled in the Antioquia department. His early life was defined by the rugged terrain of the Colombian countryside, where he was raised in a modest, lower-middle-class family. His father, Abel de Jesus Dari Escobar Echeverri, was a humble farmer who toiled in the fields to provide for his family while his mother, Hermilda de los Dolores Gaviria Berrio, was a school teacher, instilling in her children the value of education. Despite these values, the Escobar household was far from wealthy, and young Pablo quickly learned the harsh realities of life in rural Colombia. Growing up, Escobar was acutely aware of his family's economic limitations. The desire to escape the suffocating grip of poverty became a powerful motivator for him. From a young age, he displayed an extraordinary ambition that set him apart from his peers. Escobar's mother often remarked on his determination, recalling how he would say, I want to be the president of Colombia. This early declaration was not a mere childhood fantasy, but rather the first indication of his unyielding drive to achieve power and wealth by any means necessary. As he entered his teenage years, Escobar's ambition began to manifest in more tangible, albeit illegal, ways. The idyllic yet impoverished landscape of his hometown provided little opportunity for legitimate advancement and Escobar soon turned to petty crime as a means to supplement his family's income. His first foray into the world of crime was relatively innocuous, selling contraband cigarettes and fake lottery tickets on the streets of Medellin, the nearest big city. However, these early ventures were just the beginning. One of the more notorious stories from Escobar's youth involves his involvement in the theft and resale of tombstones. In a macabre twist, Escobar and his friends would steal tombstones from cemeteries, scrub off the original inscriptions, and resell them to local smugglers. This criminal enterprise, though grim, was highly profitable, and it marked the beginning of Escobar's career in organized crime. It was during this period that he began to cultivate his reputation for ruthlessness and cunning, a reputation that would follow him throughout his life. Escobar's disregard for the law and his growing ambition were clear even in these early criminal activities. He understood that the path to power and wealth was not paved with hard work and perseverance in the traditional sense, but rather with audacity and a willingness to cross moral and legal boundaries. His ability to exploit the weaknesses of others, combined with his charismatic yet calculating nature, would soon propel him to far greater heights in the underworld. In these formative years, the seeds of Escobar's future empire were sown. The young boy from Rio Negro, who once dreamed of being president, would soon embark on a path that would lead him to become one of the most feared and powerful men in the world. But at this stage in his life, he was just beginning to explore the dark possibilities that lay ahead, driven by an insatiable hunger for power and a relentless desire to escape the poverty that had defined his early years. Pablo Escobar's rise from a small-time criminal to the most powerful drug lord in history was a story of ambition, innovation, and ruthless efficiency. By the 1970s, as the demand for cocaine began to skyrocket in the United States, Escobar saw an opportunity to expand his operations far beyond Colombia's borders. He co-founded the Medellin Cartel, which quickly grew into the most notorious and feared drug trafficking organization in the world. Escobar's ability to capitalize on the burgeoning cocaine market was unmatched, and he systematically dismantled anyone who stood in his way. Escobar's approach to building his empire was meticulously strategic. He once remarked, The purpose of war is peace. 
a reflection of his belief that violence was a necessary tool to achieve his goals. Under his leadership, the Medellin cartel became synonymous with brutality and innovation in the drug trade. Escobar's operations were unlike anything the world had seen before. He understood that to maintain a steady supply of cocaine to the lucrative U.S. market, he needed to outthink, outmaneuver, and outpace law enforcement at every turn. One of the key factors behind the cartel's dominance was Escobar's pioneering smuggling techniques. In the early years, the cartel relied on small airplanes to ferry drugs across the Caribbean and into the United States. As authorities began to crack down on these operations, Escobar devised increasingly sophisticated methods to evade detection. He famously employed submarines to transport large quantities of cocaine underwater, circumventing radar and coast guard patrols. This tactic alone allowed him to move massive amounts of cocaine with little interference, solidifying his control over the supply chain. Escobar's creativity didn't stop there. He also used hollowed-out statues to conceal shipments of cocaine, sending them as seemingly legitimate art exports to the United States and Europe. This method was particularly effective as it exploited the lack of scrutiny given to art imports. By the time authorities caught on, Escobar had already flooded the market with his product, making billions in the process. These innovations earned him the title of the King of Cocaine, a moniker that reflected both his dominance in the drug trade and his ability to stay one step ahead of his pursuers. As the Medellin cartel grew in power, so did Escobar's wealth. At the height of his empire, Escobar was estimated to be earning $420 million a week, making him one of the wealthiest individuals on the planet. His net worth was so immense that he had to stash piles of cash in warehouses and fields, often losing millions to rats and mold. His brother, Roberto Escobar, once quipped, Pablo was earning so much that each year we would write off 10% of the money because the rats would eat it in storage or it would be damaged by water or lost. Despite these losses, Escobar's fortune only continued to grow, as did his influence. Escobar's wealth afforded him an unprecedented level of power, not just within the drug trade but across Colombia as a whole. He recognized that money could buy loyalty, and he used it to cement his status as a man of the people. In Medellin, Escobar carefully crafted a Robin Hood-like persona, portraying himself as a benefactor to the poor. He funded the construction of housing projects, sports facilities, and schools in some of the city's poorest neighborhoods. These acts of charity were not just a way to launder money. They were a calculated move to build a base of popular support that could protect him from law enforcement. Residents of Medellin, who benefited from Escobar's largesse, often viewed him as a hero. One local, who lived in a housing project built by Escobar, later recalled, He did a lot of good for the people here. He gave us homes when no one else would. To us, he was a savior. This sentiment was widespread, and it provided Escobar with a level of protection that few criminals could ever achieve. The people of Medellin, many of whom were deeply impoverished, saw Escobar as someone who cared about their plight, even if his money came from illegal activities. But Escobar's ambitions extended far beyond his philanthropic efforts. He sought to wield political power as well, believing that it would grant him even greater protection and legitimacy. In 1982, he successfully entered Colombian politics, becoming an alternate member of the Colombian Congress. This move was part of a broader strategy to shield himself from prosecution by securing political immunity. However, Escobar's political career was short-lived. His involvement in the drug trade was soon exposed by then-Justice Minister Rodrigo Lara Bonilla, who denounced Escobar's criminal activities on the floor of Congress. The scandal led to Escobar's expulsion from Congress and the beginning of a fierce and bloody conflict with the Colombian government. Escobar's entry into politics proved to be a turning point. While it initially provided him with a degree of protection, it also brought him into the spotlight in a way that made him a prime target for both the Colombian authorities and the U.S. government. His attempt to blend criminal enterprise with legitimate political power backfired, drawing the ire of those who sought to dismantle his empire. 
The increased scrutiny that came with his political ambitions marked the beginning of the end for Escobar, as the very institutions he tried to infiltrate now turned their full force against him. This period in Escobar's life illustrates the precarious balance he tried to maintain between his public and private personas. On one hand, he was the benevolent benefactor who provided for the poor. On the other, he was the ruthless drug lord who would stop at nothing to achieve his goals. As his power grew, so did the challenges he faced, and the consequences of his actions began to catch up with him. The once invincible kingpin found himself increasingly isolated as the world he had built on violence, corruption, and fear began to crumble around him. Pablo Escobar's reign over the Medellin cartel was marked by a level of violence and terror that Colombia had never experienced before. As he solidified his control over the cocaine trade, Escobar employed a ruthless strategy of narco-terrorism, systematically eliminating anyone who dared to oppose him. His targets were not limited to rival drug traffickers, but extended to politicians, judges, journalists, and law enforcement officials. This reign of terror was designed to instill fear and ensure that Escobar remained untouchable. Escobar's approach to maintaining power was brutally effective. He famously declared plata o plomo, which translates to silver or lead, meaning that individuals could either accept his bribes or face death. This binary choice was a cornerstone of his strategy, ensuring that corruption and fear spread throughout Colombia's institutions. Those who chose to resist often paid with their lives. Escobar's hitmen, known as sicarios, were responsible for the deaths of hundreds, if not thousands, of people. They carried out assassinations with impunity, targeting anyone perceived as a threat to Escobar's empire. Among the most notorious acts of violence orchestrated by Escobar was the assassination of Luis Carlos Galán, a popular presidential candidate who had vowed to extradite drug lords to the United States. On August 18, 1989, Galán was gunned down at a campaign rally in Bogota, sending shockwaves throughout the country. Galan's murder was a turning point in Colombia's history, marking the moment when the full extent of Escobar's reach became painfully clear. The killing of a presidential candidate underscored the power that Escobar wielded and the lengths to which he would go to protect his interests. Judges and law enforcement officials were also frequent targets of Escobar's wrath. Judge Carlos Valencia, who presided over several cases against Escobar's associates, was assassinated in 1986 after refusing to drop charges. Similarly, the Medellin cartel was implicated in the bombing of Avianca Flight 203 in 1989, which killed all 107 passengers on board. The bombing was intended to eliminate a presidential candidate who was believed to be on the flight, but the carnage claimed the lives of innocent civilians instead. This act of terrorism was one of the deadliest in Colombia's history and highlighted the lengths to which Escobar would go to eliminate his enemies. The fear that Escobar instilled in Colombia was palpable. Citizens lived in constant terror, knowing that crossing the drug lord could result in their death or the death of their loved ones. Journalists who dared to report on his activities were often silenced permanently. One such journalist was Guillermo Cano, the editor of El Espectador, a newspaper that frequently published exposés on Escobar and the Medellín cartel. Cano was assassinated in 1986, his murder serving as a chilling reminder of the risks associated with speaking out against Escobar. The impact of Escobar's reign of terror on Colombian society was devastating. The country descended into chaos, with thousands of lives lost in the violence that followed Escobar's rise to power. The fabric of Colombian society was torn apart as corruption infiltrated every level of government and the rule of law became increasingly tenuous. Families were torn apart by the violence, and entire communities lived in fear of the cartel's wrath. The scars left by Escobar's reign are still visible in Colombia today, as the country continues to grapple with the legacy of the drug trade and its associated violence. Behind this facade of terror, however, was a different side of Pablo Escobar, private life that he fiercely protected. Despite his public image as a ruthless drug lord, Escobar was also a family man who went to great lengths to shield his wife, Maria Victoria Henao, and their two children from the violent world he inhabited. 
To his family, he was a loving husband and father, often spending time with them at his luxurious estate, Hacienda Napoles. The estate, located in the Antiochia department, was a symbol of Escobar's wealth and power, featuring its own private zoo, complete with exotic animals, and a personal airstrip. Hacienda Napoles was not just a home, it was a testament to Escobar's obsession with control and his desire to create a world where he was the absolute ruler. The estate was outfitted with every luxury imaginable, from a massive swimming pool to a bullfighting ring. It was here that Escobar entertained guests, including politicians, celebrities, and even other criminals. Yet, despite the opulence, there was always an undercurrent of danger. The estate was heavily guarded, and Escobar's paranoia was evident in the layers of security he maintained. The contrast between Escobar's public and private lives added to the mystique that surrounded him. While he was a brutal enforcer in the drug world, he was also a man who loved his family deeply. This duality was a key component of the mythos that grew around him, a mythos that has only expanded since his death. Stories of Escobar's hidden wealth and secret hideouts have become the stuff of legend, perpetuated by those who knew him and by the popular culture that continues to explore his life. One of the most persistent myths is the idea that Escobar buried vast sums of money in secret locations across Colombia. Despite numerous searches, including by treasure hunters and even by the Colombian government, the bulk of Escobar's fortune has never been found. This has led to endless speculation and conspiracy theories about where the money might be hidden. Some believe that Escobar's wealth is buried in the jungles of Colombia, while others think it might be hidden in bank accounts under false names. The mystery of Escobar's missing fortune has only added to the legend, making him a figure of intrigue long after his death. Popular culture has played a significant role in shaping the public's perception of Pablo Escobar. Movies, documentaries, and television series like Narcos have portrayed him as both a villain and a complex anti-hero, further blurring the lines between the real man and the myth. These portrayals have kept Escobar's story alive, ensuring that his legacy, however dark, remains a topic of fascination. The myths and legends that have grown around Escobar are a testament to the enduring impact of his life, a life that was as contradictory as it was destructive. In the end, Pablo Escobar's reign of terror left an indelible mark on Colombia and the world. His brutal tactics, his dual persona as both benefactor and butcher, and the myths that surround him continue to captivate and horrify in equal measure. Escobar's story is a cautionary tale of unchecked ambition, the corrupting influence of power, and the devastating consequences that can arise when one man becomes too powerful. The fall of Pablo Escobar was marked by one of the most intense and coordinated manhunts in modern history. By the early 1990s, Escobar had become the world's most wanted man, his reign of terror finally catching up with him. Colombian authorities, with the full backing of the United States government and its Drug Enforcement Administration, launched an all-out effort to capture or kill the drug lord. This mission was not just a matter of law enforcement, it was a war against the man who had brought Colombia to its knees. Central to this manhunt was the vigilante group known as Los Pepes, short for Perseguidos por Pablo Escobar, people persecuted by Pablo Escobar. Los Pepes was composed of Escobar's enemies, including rival drug traffickers and former associates, as well as disgruntled members of his own cartel. Backed by Colombian authorities and the DEA, Los Pepes embarked on a ruthless campaign to dismantle Escobar's empire. They targeted his associates, bombed his properties, and assassinated anyone connected to the Medellin cartel. The group's actions were brutal, but they played a significant role in weakening Escobar's power base. Steve Murphy, one of the DEA agents involved in the manhunt, later recalled, 
We were dealing with the most dangerous man on the planet, and every day was a life or death situation. The pressure was immense, and we knew that if we made one wrong move, it could be our last. The manhunt took a heavy toll on those involved, as Escobar's reach extended far and wide. Colombian police officers, soldiers, and government officials were routinely targeted by the cartel's sicarios, who carried out assassinations with ruthless efficiency. As the net closed in, Escobar found himself increasingly isolated. His once loyal allies were either dead or had turned against him, and his fortune, which had once seemed limitless, was rapidly dwindling. The man who had once controlled a vast criminal empire was now on the run, forced to live like a fugitive in his own country. His last refuge, the luxurious prison he had built for himself, known as La Catedral, had been exposed as a sham. Escobar escaped from La Catedral in July 1992, after the Colombian government attempted to transfer him to a more secure facility. This escape marked the beginning of the final chapter in his life. The hunt for Escobar reached its climax on December 2, 1993. After 16 months on the run, Escobar was finally tracked down by Colombian forces who had been closing in on his location in Medellin. The intelligence came from a combination of intercepted communications and tips from informants, many of whom had been close to Escobar but had turned against him in his final days. On that fateful day, Escobar was staying in a modest house in a middle-class neighborhood in Medellin far from the opulent estates he had once called home. As Colombian police and military forces surrounded the house, Escobar made a desperate attempt to escape, climbing onto the rooftop in a last-ditch effort to flee. But the noose was too tight, and there was nowhere left to run. In the ensuing firefight, Escobar was shot and killed. The exact details of his death remain somewhat controversial, with some reports suggesting that he was killed by Colombian forces, while others claim that Escobar, cornered and facing capture, took his own life. Regardless of how it happened, the result was the same. The reign of Pablo Escobar had come to a bloody and ignominious end. The aftermath of Escobar's death was felt immediately. For his family, it marked the beginning of a new, uncertain chapter. His wife and children fled Colombia, seeking refuge in other countries to escape the wrath of their father's enemies. They would live in relative obscurity, their lives forever shadowed by the legacy of the man who had once been one of the most powerful figures in the world. For Colombia, Escobar's death was both a relief and a turning point. It signaled the end of the Medellin cartel's dominance and marked the beginning of a new era in the country's fight against the drug trade. However, the scars left by Escobar's reign of terror did not heal overnight. The country faced the monumental task of rebuilding its institutions, restoring the rule of law, and addressing the deep-seated social issues that had allowed Escobar to rise to power in the first place. The manhunt for Escobar may have ended with his death, but the impact of his life continued to be felt for years to come as Colombia slowly emerged from the shadow of the man who had once terrorized a nation.